Hey folks, so I normally make a beginner strategy video after teaching a game, but I'm going to do something a little different for Sidereal Confluence. And there's two reasons. First off, the factions are so different from each other that any advice I could give that would be effective for all of them would be obvious to the point of uselessness. And second, I'm not good at this game, and I don't think I ever will be, so I don't feel especially confident in telling anyone else what the best ways to play are. Now that being said, there is one thing I can do that will make things easier for you, and that's to go through each of the nine factions and explain how they work, and maybe give a quick tip for playing against each of them. I'll be going in ascending order of difficulty, mostly, so let's get started with the easy factions. The Kitzerkit Riddle Adhocracy, as well as having just a banger name, are pretty straightforward in their strategy, but these insatiable bugs do have a few things to set up at the beginning, namely your starting converters and the null space colonies. The converters come in two parts, but they aren't interchangeable, they have to start in these pairings. They function just like regular converters, but each side can be individually upgraded, and if you trade them away, you have to give both cards. These converters are good, but the kit's real strength comes from their colonies. You have a deck of null space colonies that is exclusive to you, at least until they get played. During the trade phase, you can look through this deck and play any of them, paying the cost at the top, which is always one or two yellow cubes. The kit can support any number of colonies, so putting out a lot of these worlds can net you a powerful passive income. On top of that, when bidding for colonies, the kit always win ties, regardless of how many colonies they actually have out. And for research teams, their tiebreaker value is infinity, so if all else is equal, they'll win those ties too. Now, if you're playing against them, keep in mind that they will always want green and yellow cubes. Green for their most powerful converter, yellow for those colonies. And they can also be a good source of planets if you aren't having any luck during the colony bids. Next up, we have the Kalian Plutocracy. These plant-based farmers are very good with colonies, but they're going to have trouble getting them. You have the lowest tiebreaker in the game, and every time you bid for a colony, the value of the ships you bring in is halved. So if you spend three, you actually only have one and a half. This counts for both determining order and paying for colonies, so if you only bid one ship, that'll end up being half a ship, and you won't be able to get anything because the lowest minimum bid is one. When you do take a colony from the bid track, though, you get to put a seedling on it, and this allows you to run this colony's converter twice each economy phase. It doesn't affect the cost to upgrade it, and the seedling stays on the card when you upgrade or trade it away, but you don't get to place a seedling on a colony that you get from another player. Lastly, some Kalian cards can be upgraded through a conversion that will also give you a yellow cube, which can be used or traded immediately. Now, if you're playing against the Kalian, they'll need ships because getting these upgraded colonies is pretty vital, so you can overvalue these a bit when trading to them. Don't be too greedy, though, because getting one of their planets can be a big windfall, so maybe stay in their good graces at least a little bit. Up next are the Kajas Javikalim Directorate, and these militaristic dinos are going to change things up before the game even gets started. First things first, when setting up the colony track, grab the boards meant for a player count one higher than what you actually have, if possible. As with the last two factions, the Kajas are also a little obsessed with colonies, but again, the specifics are completely different. When bidding for colonies, the Kajas may split their bid in two as evenly as possible in order to buy two colonies. It works like this. Let's say you bid five ships and think you might want to split. Someone else bids six like a madman, so they'll buy first, then once it gets to you, you decide to split dropping down to two bids of three and two. Maybe no one else bid three or more, so you have first pick, but then two other players bid two. You'll include the colony you bought in the first bid when breaking ties for the second, so now you have more colonies than anyone else and will have to wait your turn. The reason you'll want so many colonies is because you'll have to spend them to play territory tiles. These three tiles will provide some powerful converters, but they'll cost a number of specific colonies in order to play and upgrade them. Once you have them out though, you can treat them like any other converter card. Now the Kajas can be pretty self-sufficient, but they need a lot of colonies for their best stuff, so selling them your planets can be lucrative because they'll probably be willing to pay. Just know that you'll be fueling their economic engine by doing so. The next faction to talk about is the Fodderon Conclave, and if you read the backstories, you'll see that pretty much every other faction sees the Fodderon as either total bros or total jerks. In any case, they're all about science, invention, and taking credit for things. There are two big aspects to their gameplay, acknowledgments and relic worlds. Acknowledgements are tokens that you can give to other players, and then they have to hold on to them until they research a technology. Whenever this happens, they must acknowledge your help by giving back one token, and then you get one point. This doesn't benefit them in any way, so in order to get a player to accept these tokens, you'll probably need to sweeten the deal a little bit. On the other hand, the relic worlds are mostly something you'll engage with on your own. Shuffle this deck at the beginning of the game, and then once per turn during trade, you can pay four white cubes and an ice colony to discover one of these worlds by flipping the card. Each of these has some pretty cool benefits, and there are explanations for the more complicated ones on this secondary board, 
but this doesn't actually show all of them. When playing against the Faderon, the more players there are, the more wary you should be about accepting these acknowledgements. And the last faction that I would put into the easy category is the Imdril Nomads. These very fashionable dragons have no colony support, because nomads, but they do have something unique called fleet support. See, their converters are powerful, but they all have a fleet requirement shown in the top left. These requirements are filled by having enough fleets to match, so if I wanted to run these three converters, I would need at least five fleets, along with the necessary resources. You start with this two fleet card and have a deck of discoverable fleets that you can play from during trade by paying the cost. The fleet requirements apply even if you give your tech away, so if someone wants to use one of your converters, you'll need to also give them fleets to match. And something to keep in mind, just because you have no colony support doesn't mean you can't bid on colonies. However, you will need to trade them away before the economy phase, otherwise they'll just get discarded. When playing against the Imdril, be wary about giving them too much in the early game, as their late game potential is extremely powerful if they have a strong start. And those are the five factions that I'd classify as the easy ones. If it's your first game, try to play as one of these. And after you get to know the game a little bit better, or if you've got a big group of new players and you're feeling cocky, then you can give one of the harder factions a try. Before we jump in, I just want to say really quickly that most of these factions are not that hard to understand mechanically. Instead, their difficulty comes from how effectively you'll be able to trade with other players. They're not necessarily worse than other factions, but if you can't convince people to buy what you're selling at a good rate, you might have a rough time with them, as I did on my first game of Sidereal when I played as the Unity. This digital hive mind will never produce a lot of resources, but they can utilize anything in order to make everything. They achieve this via flexible inputs and outputs. Many of the Unity converters can take any resources, provided they're the right size, and some will create Unity wild resources. These great cubes can be used by any player as if they were any cube of a matching size, so make sure that other players know what you're offering and that you're willing to trade for whatever scraps they got lying around. Now, the Unity only support one colony, but they can also make computer worlds. These are four converters that require you to spend a colony and some resources in order to put them out, and then they'll further your ability to churn out wilds. You can create these in any order, and once out, they function just like any other converter. Now, the Unity Wilds can't be stolen by the Zeth, and they work in a specific way with the Enietz Interest Converters, but I'll cover that in more detail in just a minute. When playing against the Unity, they'll be able to fill in whatever gaps you have. Just be careful to avoid becoming dependent on their Wilds, as their prices will likely go up over time. Next up, we have the Enietz. These giant squid bankers have a suite of interest-generating converters that, unfortunately, they aren't actually able to run on their own. Everyone else has the opposable thumbs needed to operate this machinery, though, so they'll want to trade with you to get them. When running an interest converter, a player will input a number of resources that can be any color but must match each other and the listed size, and then they'll get out more of that same good. Unity Wilds can be put in to match other cubes, and you'll get the same amount of them back, but not any more. Even if the input is all wilds, you'll have to just pick a color of cubes as the interest. And that's pretty much all there is to know about the NET, but because this information is actually what everyone else needs to know, make sure you give them all a heads up at the beginning of the game. When playing against the NET, they'll regularly want white and blue cubes, so offering those in exchange for these interest converters should be an attractive deal for them. While not the last faction on this list, the Yangi Society are probably the most difficult to play. That's because this crystalline conglomeration doesn't share the technology it creates. Now, that's to your benefit, because it means you'll have exclusive rights to some converters, but it also means that you won't get the normal sharing bonus. Instead, you'll get the heavily reduced Yangi sharing bonus, shown on the bottom of each Confluence card. The Yangi do still receive technologies when other players share them, though. And you can license your technology as part of a trade, allowing another player to find the matching converter and add it to their tableau, and this can be done during the trade phase that the tech was invented. If playing against the Yangi, bid a little extra if you see a research team that you really want, because if they take it, you might never get that technology. And lastly, we have the Zeth. These betentacled hucksters are a little complex mechanically, but more importantly, they can be pretty difficult to play against, so they aren't recommended when playing with anyone who's brand new. The Zeth are unique because of their ability to steal from other players. These red arrow converters run during the Zeth steal phase, which occurs at the end of the confluence if you're playing with the Zeth. Let's take this black market card for example. You'll have a choice of how you pay the input, but let's ignore the envoys on the left for now and say we pay one black cube. After doing that, you can steal one large cube from any player, but remember, you can't steal Unity Wild Cubes. Also, I say any player, but that's not always the case. When you set up the Zeth, you should display these danger tokens for each faction in the game. If you make a trade with another player, flip their token from danger to safe, indicating that you can't steal from them this round. This does not count gifts unless the Zeth explicitly agree to offer safety as a part of it. 
Basically, instead of any legitimate business, you're running a protection racket. And the last thing that will help you out are these Envoy tokens. You start with a small pile of them, and you can include them in trades to other players, but they aren't actually going to want them, and you can't just give them away. That is, unless you turn them into donations via the Envoy's converter. This makes a whole mess of resources that all have to be given or traded to the same player along with an Envoy. Once players have your Envoys, they can't ever get rid of them, and you'll have access to the cheaper options for your stealing converters. Going back to the black market, if a player has two of your Envoys and is still in danger, you don't have to pay anything in order to steal a big cube from them. This doesn't remove the Envoys either, so once you get some leverage on someone, you can keep leaning on them for the rest of the game. And one last thing to be aware of is that upgrading the Zeth starting converters is not as straightforward as the others. There's only one option for each card, and when you flip them, you'll often see a change in the input options along with the boost in output. Or in the case of the Envoys, the output is almost completely different. When playing against the Zeth, collective bargaining might be your best bet. The more players avoid paying protection, the less the Zeth have to work with. Yes, they'll still steal, but not from everyone all at once. And those are all the factions in Sidereal Confluence. I hope this helps get to the table, and as a quick note, my Patreon backers got to watch this video a month before everyone else. If you want early access to videos like this, or to vote on what games I teach, head on over to the Patreon and become a rules lawyer. If you already know that because you already are one, well, thank you so much for supporting the channel. It really means a lot to me. Either way, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!